Had the murders in Sarajevo been committed even a century earlier, it would have taken weeks or months for word of it to reach faraway places. The consequences might have been far different, but technology had changed all that. The foreign officers of the world knew of the shooting at once. In Germany, the Kaiser was informed while racing in a regatta aboard his yacht, Meteor. Wilhelm decided to return to Berlin. In England, the outrage, as the assassinations were called, dominated the foreign reporting published in the morning's London Times. In France, at the first cabinet meeting since the assassinations, the killings were hardly mentioned. Indeed, in all the capitals of Europe, the reaction to the assassination of the heir to the Habsburg throne was calm to the point of indifference. The truth of the matter was that few in Austria-Hungary were sorry that Franz Ferdinand had been removed from the scene. True, the leaders of the dual monarchy deplored the killing of royalty, but if someone of the blood had to be sacrificed, the Archduke was everybody's choice to be the one. Of course, the heir apparent was next only to the Emperor, the most important figure in the Habsburg Empire. In murdering him, upstart Serbian terrorists threw down a public challenge to the very existence of the Empire. If Vienna failed to respond, it would lose by default. But that was not the reason that the dual monarchy sought to destroy Serbia. The Habsburgs wanted to destroy Serbia before the assassination. The killings gave Vienna an excuse, not the reason, for snuffing out Serbia's challenge to Austro-Hungarian authority in the Balkans. First, Austria sought Germany's backing. In turn, it saw in the Austro-Serbian confrontation a golden chance of securing hegemony in Europe achieving world status while splitting the encircling Entente powers, forestalling Russian modernization and eradicating the dangers of Austria-Hungary. The Kaiser believed that, as in the past, they could keep this conflict local without going to war with other powers. The German ambassador to the dual monarchy reported to the Kaiser. Count Berthold, the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, told me today that everything pointed to the fact that the threads of the conspiracy to which the Archduke fell a sacrifice ran together at Belgrade. I frequently hear expressed in Vienna, even among serious people, the wish that at last a final and fundamental reckoning should be had with the Serbs. The Kaiser noted in the margin of his copy of the report, now or never. Four days later, on July 6th, he sent a message to the Austrian Emperor. The Emperor Franz Josef may rest assured that His Majesty will faithfully stand by Austria-Hungary, as is required by the obligations of his alliance and of his ancient friendship. And with that, on the same day, the Kaiser went back on a summer cruise on the royal yacht in Scandinavian waters. As Europe continued its perfect summer vacation, Austria went off to cash Germany's blank check for unconditional support against Serbia. Having obtained Germany's endorsement 25 days after the Archduke's assassination, Austria issued a 10-point ultimatum to Serbia. Germany's leading military figures had been on leave in July, as had the Kaiser, the Chancellor, and the Foreign Secretary. After the Austrians had set a fixed date for their ultimatum, Berlin quietly signaled its leaders to return. They did so from July 23rd onward, returning singly so as not to create an uproar. Then they began to debate what to do next. Germany's overlapping army leaders, Chief of Staff von Moltke, War Minister von Falkenhayn, and Military Cabinet Chief von Linke were among the several key officials debating the issues of war and peace after the return from vacation. For Moltke, the arguments were particularly frustrating, in part because civilian leaders shared neither his point of view nor his objectives, and in part because they did not know what he knew. 
A Saxon officer who spoke with Moltke's deputy on July 23 reported that he received the impression that the great general staff would be pleased if war were to come about now. Von Moltke did not fear Russian mobilization. He devoutly desired it. Von Moltke was uniquely aware that time was running out for his country. Germany was committed to follow von Moltke's own grand strategy, a strategy few were aware of. The Kaiser, Falkenhayn, and until July 31, the German Chancellor, Bettmann, were among those in the dark. None of them knew that Moltke had already put his plan for his opening moves in the war into motion. On 25 July, Serbia accepted nine of the points, but rejected, in part, the demand that Austrian officials be involved in the investigation of the assassination, regarding such interference as a challenge to its sovereignty. On 25 July, Serbia also mobilized her army. Russia, too, confirmed partial mobilization before entering a period preparatory to war on 26 July. Austria reciprocated by mobilizing the same day. Then, on 28 July, the dual monarchy declared war on Serbia. Now, up to this point, it might still have been possible to isolate the problem, but Germany continued to act in an uncompromising manner to heighten tensions and gave the crisis an international dimension. On 29 July, Germany demanded an immediate cessation of Russian preparations. Failing to do so would mean that Germany would mobilize her army. The German Imperial Chancellor, Theobald von bettmann holweg instructed the ambassador in St. Petersburg. Kindly call attention to the fact that further confirmation of Russia's mobilization measures would force us to mobilize. And in that case, a European war could scarcely be prevented. Russia could not afford to acquiesce meekly on the destruction of Serbian sovereignty or increased Austrian influence in Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Consequently, on 30 July, Russia ordered a general mobilization in support of Serbia. Russian mobilization began the following day, but was not the inevitable precursor to war. Her forces could, if necessary, have stayed on their own territory for weeks while negotiations proceeded. The actions of Germany heightened the tension. At 1.45 p.m. on 31 July, Germany proclaims a Kriegsgefahrstein, or threatening danger of war. 3.30 p.m., the German government addresses Russia and France. Germany presents Russia with an ultimatum. Unless she demobilizes within 12 hours, full mobilization in Germany will follow. The German ambassador in Paris is told mobilization means war. France is asked for guarantees of neutrality. Events were rapidly moving out of control. When Russia failed to respond, Germany ordered a general mobilization. Time was running out. Mobilization in each country was the moment when a war plan took effect. Nowhere was this clearer than in Germany, since Germany had become a prisoner of her own plan. The Schlieffen Plan had been originally shaped in 1897 and revised in 1905 by Count Alfred von Schlieffen, then chief of the German general staff. Schlieffen's overriding aim had been to enable Germany to deal successfully with the strategic nightmare of a two-front war against Russia and France. However, by appearing to offer a feasible solution to this problem, the plan reduced the army's fears of a two-front war and strengthened its willingness to accept the risks of such a conflict. Schlieffen estimated that should Germany have to face both France and Russia, the latter would be slower to mobilize and deploy, giving Germany a vital margin of some six weeks in which to overpower France by means of a massive and rapid campaign. As soon as France was defeated, Germany could then transfer the bulk of her forces to the east to meet the Russian steamroller. There was a danger, nonetheless, 
that the fortresses along France's northeastern frontier might fatally delay the German army's lightning western offensive. Accordingly, Schlieffen resolved that German forces must cross a narrow strip of Dutch territory known as the Maastricht Appendix, then sweep through Belgium, trampling neutrality before driving into northwestern France. The pivotal role was given to five armies deployed by Metz and Holland, totaling 35 corps in all. The most powerful forces were allocated to the extreme right wing of the offensive. One army here was expected to swing round to west of Paris on the outer flank of a colossal wheeling movement which was intended to take the opposing French armies in the rear before trapping them against their own frontier. Colonel General Helmut von Molke, Schlieffen's successor, made several key alterations to his original plan between 1906 and 1914. Though a diligent and painstaking officer, Moltke was also introspective and suffered from bouts of low self-confidence. He weakened the right flank and abandoned the planned move through Holland. These decisions would prove to be unfortunate. On 1 August, Germany could wait no longer for an answer from the Tsar and declared war on Russia. Honoring her agreement with Russia, France mobilized and set in motion the remaining cogs in the intricate machinery of European alliances. On 2 August, Germany handed Belgium an ultimatum insisting on the right of passage through her territory. The Belgians took less time to deliver a sharp no. The next day, Germany declared war on France. The French declaration of war quickly followed. Early on 4 August, German forces crossed the frontier into Belgium. The strength of the German armies on this flank was impressive. Colonel General Alexander von Klupp's first army on the extreme right numbered 320,000 troops. The neighboring second army under Colonel General Karl von Buelow and the third army commanded by General Max von Hausen respectively totaled 260,000 and 180,000. The invasion of Belgian territory brought the final major player into the conflict, Great Britain. I ask the House, from the point of view of British interests, to consider what may be at stake. If France is beaten to her knees, if in a crisis like this we run away from obligations of honor and interest as regards the Belgian treaty, we should, I believe, sacrifice our respect and good name and reputation before the world and should not escape the most serious and grave economic consequences. God grant we may not have a European war thrust upon us and for such a stupid reason too. No, I don't mean stupid. But to have to go to war on account of tiresome Serbia beggars belief. Britain had no formal agreement with France and Russia, but was committed in principle by a treaty concluded in 1839 to guarantee Belgian neutrality. The hour had struck. At 11 p.m. on 4 August, time ran out for the last summer of the old world. Standing on the balcony at his residence, British Home Secretary Sir Edward Grey watched the lamplighters move along the street below. The lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. 